Okay. Okay. Um, okay, so welcome to the IMA Data Science Seminar. Um, so uh, just to mention, you can, you've, you're can you welcome to ask questions during the talk. There's a Q&A button at the bottom of the screen, and I'll try to watch this, or you can ask questions afterwards. Um, so I'm very uh, happy today to um, introduce our speaker, uh, Yujin Chen. Um, he's an Associate Professor of Statistics and Data Science. Um, uh, at the University of Pennsylvania, um, and prior to that, he was had a position at Princeton for for some number of years, and was a postdoc at Stanford, and got his PhD also at Stanford. Um, his research interests are in mathematics of data science, um, statistics, information theory optimization, um, reinforcement learning, and applications to medical imaging, uh, power electronics, and computational biology. Um, so today, uh, he's going to talk to us about taming non-convexity in tensor completion, uh, fast convergence, and uncertainty quantification. Well, please go ahead. Okay, thanks a lot, Jeff, for uh, introducing me and for Gilad for inviting me for this to give this seminar. Uh, I was here like five years ago, and so it's great to give a seminar again in this uh, seminar series. So my talk today uh, is about a non converse problem called low rank tensor completion. Uh, I'm going to talk about how to use optimization based approach uh, to find fast solution for this problem, as well how to conduct uh, uncertainty quantification for the solution that we obtain. All right. Okay, so uh, I probably don't have to mention why non converse uh, optimization is important. So we really have seen a lot of non converse problems everywhere in all sorts of applications, uh, ranging from computer vision to uh, robotics, neural nets, reinforcement learning, so on and so forth. In many of these problems, uh, the problem can be formulated as some optimization problem where the loss function is usually highly non converse in the decision variable we have. And so we really have, uh, have uh, pressing needs in dealing with non convexity in all of these data science problems. Um, as everybody uh, knows, non converse optimization is in general not the easy things to solve. Uh, in fact, many of the problems could be MP hard to solve. Uh, in fact, uh, more than two decades ago, people already showed that uh, even for some sort of one layer neural net, uh, you can already design so that it has maybe exponential number of local solutions, uh, which will uh, be very problematic because they will confuse you when you are trying to design dual algorithm, so making it very difficult to find the true global solution. And as a result, this this usually is cast as a very challenging problems uh, in general. However, uh, applied scientists and uh, engineers are typically not are going to be scared away by the non convexity issue. Uh, usually, they just take whatever problems they have uh, and then use some very basic uh, algorithms like gradient descent, stochastic gradient descent, and their variants uh, to solve it. And for many of the problems, uh, actually, this very simple paradigm actually works quite well. And actually, this very intriguing uh, message uh, uh, inspires a lot of researchers to try to see whether they can explain uh, the effectiveness of this kind of approach and whether at least if we focus on some very specific problem, whether we can say something more than the general worst case intractability about this problem. Okay, so and one way uh, that has been effective in handling some of the problems is to trying to bring statistical models uh, into the picture. Uh, in particular, if we forget about the worst case scenario, but rather focus on some models generated by some nice statistical models, and then maybe uh, there's a, uh, some better chance that we can probably solve some of the problem in a much nicer way than the general MP hardness thing. And this actually has been explored in many of the problems ranging from phase retrieval, low rank matrix completion, and some simple neural nets and so on and so forth. Okay, so we have we have actually written the monograph focusing on how non compass optimization can help us solve low rank matrix estimation problem. And uh, the article is listed here. So in my talk today, we're going to go beyond low rank matrix estimation 
uh, but instead trying to talk about something that's higher order than this. But the message is going to be roughly the same. We're going to try to see how, high, how the statistics and high dimensional probability can help us understand the effectiveness of non convex optimization uh, in terms of multiple things, including uh, uh, com computational efficiency, sample efficiency, statistical accuracy of the pointy convergence tool, and as well as a problem called uncertainty for quantification, which is very important in the statistics literature. So this is the problem that we're going to focus on. It's so-called low rank tensor completion. And this is joint work with uh, my former student, Chang Xiao Tai, who is currently a postdoc at UPenn, uh, my current postdoc, Gun Li, and my colleague, Yue Jie Chi from Carnegie Mellon University, and my colleague, uh, Vincent Poole from Princeton. Feel free to interrupt me anytime if you have any question. All right, okay, so uh, let's First, try to motivate why do we care about tensor data. Uh, in many of the applications, from genomics to uh, computer graphics, computer vision to medical imaging, uh, the data we have might actually not be the usual two-dimensional image data, but instead it might be more, more uh, like three or four dimensional. For example, if you look at this dynamic MRI problem, so in medical imaging, every time you can get the image but you can actually collect a sequence of uh, uh, MR images across time. And if you put all of these images together and it sort of like forms a 3D kind of object, right? X, Y, and also a time axis. And there are a lot of correlation uh, in the across the time domain as well, and which actually motivates a lot of uh, medical imaging researchers to actually think about how to exploit the high a multi-way tensor data structure in order to uh, accelerate uh, the image reconstruction. Okay, and so this kind of uh, actually message actually permeates many of the data science applications, and you will see more and more this kind of things across in uh, data science applications. So in general, uh, tensor estimation actually it faces a lot of challenges that are very similar to what we have already encountered in the Loran matrix case. Uh, for example, there are a lot of applications where you do not really have complete observation of every entry of the tensor. Uh, there might be a lot of missing data there, and but you still have to try your best to find a good estimate. Uh, and as usual, all of the observations might be corrupted by uh, noise, random noise, and we need to see how are we going to find this true signal from, you know, like this, uh, uh, in the presence of a lot of these uh, random noise. So all of these are common challenges in the statistical estimation uh, problem and, and tensor case is no exception. We still have to deal with them, except that now might be it's even harder to uh, take care of these issues. So if we only have missing data, if we have very high signal to noise ratio, uh, in general, we won't be, uh, there's no hope that we can try to uh, recover or reconstruct the tensor in a faithful way, unless we make some more assumptions. And a common assumption that try to help us uh, 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 avoid the curse of dimensionality is to try to assume some sort of low dimensional structure. So this is one common assumption that's using the tensor literature, which sort of like a counterpart of the low rank structure of matrix in matrix estimation case, uh, try to extend it to the tensor case. Uh, there are actually multiple, more than one definition of ranks in tensor. Tensor usually is much more complicated to define. Uh, the way that I, I'm going to impose in this talk uh, is the so-called low CP rank structure, which essentially is trying to say that we're assuming the ground truth tensor, it's a superposition of a small number of rank one tensor. Okay, so in the symmetric tensor case, this can essentially be represented using this kind of, uh, this expression here. So each of them, each of component is rank one, um, and we have R of them, uh, uh, put together, and where R is much smaller than the ambient dimension of the tensor, 
Okay, so this kind of low dimensional structure enables us to perform better reconstruction in the presence of incomplete data and also uh, uh, a lot of random noise. All right, okay. So let me try to be spend a little more time to try to make the, the, the problem formulation more, more precise. Uh, throughout this talk, uh, for simplicity of presentation, I'm going to focus only on the symmetric tensor, uh, taking the following form, where T star, which is the ground true tensor, it's a summation of UI star, which is one of the tensor factor, cross UI star, cross UI star. Uh, sim the symmetry property is not important at all. It can be generalized to asymmetric tensor in the, essentially the same way. And then we'll introduce many, many more in notation for this talk. So that's why I choose to be more concise here, focusing on the sim simpler model. Uh, we're going to assume that this tensor is, has dimension d by d by d, okay? Where d is supposed to be something large, okay? But, and the rank r is supposed to be smaller than d. Okay, so, uh, and then we have, uh, uh, in complete data and we have random noise, uh, which can be modeled in the following way. So suppose that we have a random sampling set omega, which is like an index set. It's a small index set. Um, and then uh, this is randomly chosen. And for each entry within this, uh, this index set, we're able to take an observation. And the observation takes the following form. It is the ground truth entry plus some noise there. All right, okay, so it's a very basic model. We only observe noisy observation over this sampling set called omega. Okay, now, uh, given this set of uh, noisy data, our goal is very simple. We try to estimate both the ground truth tensor T star and the ground truth tens uh, tensor factors UI starts from this set of observations. All right, okay, so let me know if this is not clear. All right, okay, so now let's try to talk a little bit more about the challenge actually uh, that's sort of like unique to, uh, not sort of not present in the matrix case, but more unique in, the, but sort of like everywhere in the tensor case. So in tensor case, now one natural question for us to ask is that how many samples, how many observations are needed for us to, in order to estimate the tensor, ground truth tensor in a consistent way? Okay, now to answer this question, now usually we start with some information theoretic thinking, right? So let's look at which is also called the statistical limit. So if the rank is order one, think about the easiest case where the rank is even just maybe just one. Now, how many free parameters are there? And there are a total number of D parameters there. So this sort of like give us an information theoretic lower bound, which is sort of like D. Uh, so we are, a natural hope is that we can try to solve the problem even when sample size is only slightly above this information theoretic lower limit. However, uh, there is a negative message uh, that tells us that uh, what, regardless of which algorithm you are trying to use, if you are trying to solve it in polynomial time, then so far there's no algorithm that has been developed, developed that is able to work with the sample size smaller than d to the 1.5, okay? So what does this mean? This means that if you care about computational cost, if, if you care about polynomial time kind of tractability, then essentially there's no algorithm, polynomial algorithm that can help you solve the problem below this computation limit, okay? And this has been a very uh, 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 remarkable message, which stands in stark contrast to the matrix case, where in the matrix case, there's typically not such kind of a big gap there. Okay. Uh, in light of this gap, uh, my talk today is not try to break this gap because I think this is my, although this is a conjecture, but I sort of believe that this is sort of true. But our focus is try to say whether we are able to find a good algorithm that at least works uh, as long as uh, we are above the computational limit. Okay, so this is our goal today. 
Sorry, can, can I just interrupt with a, a question? Awesome. You, you may have explained this and I, I missed it. So, but what, what, what are you assuming about, about how many samples you have oh, versus the size so, of the matrix? Yeah, so it's a great question. Something that I have not talked about. So I talk about random sampling set. So suppose I'm taking random samples from random entries of this large tensor. The number of entries I observe is going to be the number of samples that I, I, I'm referring to. So so, how does that like what what would what, uh, how does that scale say with the with B um, like like do you do you have uh, you a can, number of samples you can, proportional? You can, yeah, you can just say okay, I I I give you a I'm I'm allowed to take D to the one point five number of entries something like that. You can say I can I'm allowed to take you know D uh, D entries or something like that. But you you can set a number. Uh, that's a function of your dimension. And in advance, uh, and then you take random samples, so something like that. I see. So wait. So 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 sorry. So in the next slide, when when you're talking about d to the three halves, yeah, that, is that referring to the number of samples you need? Number of entries. Like the, the number of entries that I observe. So so you will keep taking more entry, more and more entries, more 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 and more observations of the entries, and once the number of entries you observe exceeds d to the one point five. And then there might be polynomial time algorithm for you to do the estimation. Otherwise, you have no way to do that. So okay, got it, got it. Thanks for clarifying. Thanks, thanks for the question. All right, okay. Any more question? Oh. All right, okay. So our focus today is to say, okay, we're going to have a, a suppose we observe more than d to the three uh, three half entries, and we try to find the fast algorithm to solve this problem. All right, okay, so there has been a lot of work uh, uh, tr uh, trying to solve this problem, and there have been a lot of different methods that have been proposed, including convex relaxation, uh, spectral method, non convex optimization, sum of square hierarchy, so on and so forth. Uh, a lot of uh, researchers have done that. Uh, so let me try to summarize some of the key work as important works here. So to give you a better sense about what has been done and what is still inadequate uh, in some of the aspects. So one of the uh, early works by uh, uh, Mingyuan and, and Sun Hui Zhang, and they proposed to use something called the tensor nuclear norm algorithm, which is if you know what is a matrix nuclear norm, it's just like a generalization to the tensor uh, 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 domain, and um, it has some nice property. If you solve, if you try to minimize tensor nuclear norm, and it allows you to solve the problem with the sample size on the order of d, maybe up to some logarithmic factor, it allows you to recover things exactly. So, so this table is for the case when there is absolutely no noise. So, try to make it simpler to begin with. All right. Unfortunately. Uh, very soon people realize that computing tensor nuclear norm itself is already MP hard. Okay, so it doesn't it means that even though this might be a good algorithm, you will never be able to compute it in practice. Okay. All right. Okay. So motivated by this, and then people try to look at more efficient uh, alternatives. So and then Ming Yuan and Dong Xia actually they they come up with a sort of like a spectral method followed by gradient descent kind of uh, algorithm that allows you to solve the problem when the sample size is above the computation limit d to the 1.5. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the work did not really provide any computational guarantees there. Actually, they just said maybe it's polynomial time, but actually it can be very big, very large polynomial in this case. Uh, Andrea Montanari and Nike Sun, and then they, they propose a spectral method to solve it, which is very nice. Uh, but the spectral method alone, actually, uh, is not going to give you an exact solution, uh, even you have absolutely no noise. So this actually solves it in a partial way, but it does not really solve it in the, in, in the, in, if, you, if you aim for exact solution. There are also two works uh, based on sum of square hierarchy. And then, so basically you try to lift the problem in much higher dimension in order to solve it. Uh, it has very nice sample size. You can get to an uh, exact solution, but uh, sum of squares algorithms are known to be very, very, very slow. For example, the computational cost could be d to the 10th. 
Okay, so this is not going to be useful if D is large. So this table summarizes what we know about the noise-free noise, noise -free case. Moving forward, if you, if you even have noise, and this is uh, what these two works, uh, provide some uh, statistical guarantees for the solution of their, the, the quality of their solutions. Uh, but in both cases, uh, even if you look at just the, the Euclidean error, the estimation error, uh, if you compare them to the minima lower bounds, actually you see the gap there. So they are both highly suboptimal. And also none of these work actually provides any sort of like entry-wise performance guarantees there, which actually oftentimes these kind of fine-grained estimation guarantees might be more useful in a lot of practical scenario. If we, for example, if we care about, you know, estimating really one entry, uh, and then, you know, like what you care about is probably not the overall error, but rather, you know, this kind of more fine-grained solution. But this is completely uh, unavailable in prior literature. Sorry, just to clarify one, yeah. one small thing. So when you say suboptimal, you mean in terms of the dependence on the noise level? Uh, in terms dependence of dependence on the noise level is tight, but usually, so we're going to get to that equation later on, but in terms of the noise level is fine, but usually the estimation error will be, uh, you know, for example, linear in the noise level, but it also depends on many other things like dimension of the problem, the sampling rate, you know, other things. But if you consider those parts, those are, you know, there's a gap between what they have obtained and what is in the information theoretical about. about. I see, I see. We're going to see some more concrete expression in a few minutes and that will try to make it more clear. Okay, but but so, sorry, just one, so, so you, you said that there is a minimax lower bound for these problems. They, yeah, minimax lower bound, you just analyze, for example, like uh, maximum likelihood estimate, for example, and then and that's usually minimized lower bound. It, 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 it's actually minimized optimal for this case, uh, but we are unable to compute min the maximum likelihood estimate in this case due to a computational issue. So, yeah. So, okay. Got it. Basically, trying to say these works, the the error bound they obtain, are, are much worse than the what can be achieved by uh, maximum likelihood estimates. Okay. Got it. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, all right, okay, so my goal here is that we try to design an algorithm that is simultaneously sample efficient, fast, and in terms of its the quality of the solution, we hope that it matches the min mass low bound. All right, okay, so let's tr let's try to see how we're going to do it. Okay, so at a, uh, to start with, let's assume that the noise is Gaussian, okay? And if this is Gaussian, a natural thing, ID Gaussian, and the natural way to uh, look at this is to try to solve the maximum likelihood estimation problem. And in this case, it sort of like becomes this kind of least square solution. So it's very easy, like for every entries that I observe. So, so U is like my decision variable. Uh, US is like, so my capital U is the all of the uh, tensor factor that I'm trying to decide on. Uh, it has R of them, U1 to UR, okay? And uh, for each entry within this sample set, uh, I can compute uh, uh, my estimate of IJ uh, for this entry and compare it to what I observe. TIJK is what I observe in this entry. I compute the L2 error, uh, square error, and then I take the sum of them. So which turns out to be the maximum likelihood estimates um, if we have Gaussian noise. All right, okay. So this is a, usually a starting point for us to think about it is not to think about this problem. Uh, now, the good thing is that we are actually able to prove that uh, this algorithm, if we can really compute the, uh, the minimizer, global minimizer, it turns out to be a statistically efficient solution. Uh, in fact, this is minimus optimal and there's no other algorithm that can beat it uh, in terms of the uh, in the uh, in, in terms of the statistical accuracy. okay, this is something that we can do. Uh, unfortunately, this is also not something that we can compute in general. Uh, the main reason is that this involves a degree six polynomial. The objective function is a degree six polynomial. And when this is degree six polynomial, uh, in general, 
it's highly non-convex and we are unnamed. we do not have a, a systematic approach general approach to try to solve it within polynomial time okay so computationally this is very challenging okay but can we just try it but forget about the general uh, track intractability can we just try to find some algorithm try to to run it and see how it performs okay now, one way to do it, a natural way to do it is to just run gradient descent, right? Okay, so now gradient descent is really every gradient descent or stochastic gradient and something like that. So suppose that we're going to run gradient descent. And usually the performance of the gradient descent algorithm might depend on how you initialize it. Uh, so let's try to just try to look at the case when we just randomly initialize it, let's say generate U naught as some in some Gaussian fraction, for example, and let's see how it works. Uh, in fact, in the uh, it's, uh, it's in the matrix case, in the matrix case, actually, this kind of uh, paradigm actually usually already work quite well, even you are starting from random initialization. So, in a problem called uh, phase retrieval, which is sort of similar to low-run matrix estimation, a few years ago we actually proved that. So, random initialization is sufficient for this algorithm to work. So now the natural thing is to try to just use it, employ it to see whether you can solve the tensor case or not. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, this is one of the big difference between the tensor case and the matrix case is that random initialization actually does not work at all, uh, at least when you are close to the computational limit. Um, in fact, unless you have a sample size that's much bigger than the computational limit, you know, it's a D square, and you won't expect this algorithm to work. And the reason actually is the following. So if the sample size is close to the computation limit, which is D to the 1.5, now if we compute the mean search direction of gradient descent in every step, uh, it turns out that you, you can see from this sort of picture is that usually it is sort of like moving towards the right direction. It has the hope that to move towards uh, the, the desired solution. Unfortunately, the issue is not in the, the mean search direction, but it comes from the variance. If you compute the variance of this case at the very beginning, the variance could be much, much bigger than the mean square of this case, actually, if, if D is very large. So if you think of the randomness, for example, you think about yeah, some sort of Gaussian kind of effect, then it will take you many, many trials, many, many restarts in order for you to even find one time where the uncertainty is does not completely bury the, the, the mean progress that you are able to, to make. So this kind of very, very high variability, it can actually preclude us from getting useful, uh, moving, preclude us from moving towards a reasonable direction. Most of the time, actually, you are moving towards some random direction due to this kind of uncertainty. So coming back to our picture, uh, this sort of means that uh, random initialization, uh, if I want to place it in this picture, it's going to be here. So if the sample size is exceeds the square, and then it has some, it can work. Otherwise, this algorithm does not work at all. So now the question, the the, the, main, the key question is that what are we going to do if we are below uh, d square, but still above the computation limit? Okay. So this is the main thing that we try to address here. So we propose an algorithm that allows us to solve the problem for this regime. And let me try to do it. It's a three stage, two or three stage kind of approach. Uh, let me try to explain it in a little more detail. It's a more complicated than this, but try to, I mean, let me just try to mention some of the key message here. So the first step uh, in the first stage, it's about initialization. Okay, so in initialization, I, I alone has two, two parts. The first part is about how to estimate the subspace uh, spanned by the ground truth tensor factor. I have R of them, 
So I, and then they span a subspace. I try to estimate them and using a spectral method, something that I'm going to talk about in one minute. After you obtain the subspace estimate, and we try to disentangle the individual factors from this subspace, okay? Eventually, we want to estimate individual factors, not the subspace spanning them. So we need to still spend some time to try to disentangle these uh, individual factors. And after the initialization, if this is a good initialization, and then we can just run gradient descent again. Okay, so let's try to run it until it converges. So this is going to be my algorithm. So what is the rationale here? The rationale is very simple. For many of the non convex problem, even though the landscape actually is very complicated, usually if you are getting closer, close enough to the, the global solution, uh, the landscape of the problem might not be that bad, okay? Maybe locally this is enjoy some sort of restricted strong complexity type of uh, uh, geometry. And if that is the case, if, and if you are able to find a good uh, starting points lying within this nice region, and then if you run gradient descent, uh, if it converges, it has to converge to the right solution. Okay, so this is a general picture. Now the question is that how are we going to guarantee that we have a warm start that really starts from this nice region or so-called basin of attraction. Okay, so uh, so let me try to spend a little more time about a little more details about the initialization stage. So as I mentioned, step 1.1 is to try to estimate the subspace spanning uh, the tensor factors, all right, okay. Uh, and the way I'm going to do it is the following. So T is my observed tensor. What I'm going to do, I don't know how to deal with tensor, but I know how to deal with matrix. So let's try to matricize it. So I start with the 3D object, and then I'm going to flatten it into a very fat matrix. And let me call you A. Then I'm trying to estimate the column subspace of this A matrix. Okay, there's one small thing that I also need to mention. It's a one natural way to estimate the subspace of based on A is try to take, you know, singular value decomposition, uh, look at the top R uh, uh, left singular subspace and use it uh, as my estimate. Unfortunately, this does not work. Uh, you have to do a little bit of trick to make it work. So the trick we do is that instead of looking at uh, singular value SVD of A, I'm going to look at eigen decomposition of A, A transpose, which still sounds the same to you. But the difference is that we are going to zero out all of the diagonal entries of A, A transpose. Okay, I'm going to off this projector means that I'm removing all the diagonal entries. And the reason is that diagonal entries contain a lot of bias there, which make it very difficult for us to, to estimate the, the part that we are interested in. We remove that, and then uh, this is going to give me a subspace estimate. I'm going to call it U sub. All right, okay, now how are we going to generate, ten to estimate tensor factors from this subspace estimate? So the way we're going to do it is the following. We're going to start from this subspace. We are going to generate the random vector, let's call it G. So basically you generate it uh, randomly, but within the subspace. Uh, and then uh, we are going to compute, uh, uh, project my tensor along this G direction. So I originally, I have three dimensional thing. I'm going to project it into two dimension. And the way I project it is, uh, uh, is, uh, is accomplished based on this, this kind of random vector. So why do I do this? Uh, after a little bit of calculation, you can see that if I do this, essentially this part, this matrix can be written of some summation of I over uh, summation over I of this kind of uh, uh, rank one components. Okay. And each of the components actually is something that we care and plus some noise. 
And then this sort of becomes a low rank uh, matrix estimation problem. And for which we have some ways to try to, to, to estimate at least, for example, the top uh, uh, component here. All right, and then we repeat it our times, and then we are going to be able to retrieve some estimate and estimate for each of the tensor factor. All right, okay, so this uh, this finishes my uh, my uh, my my algorithm. Uh, it's a bit complicated, but I think for the moment it suffices to remember two things. Uh, first, uh, I'm going to do good initialization uh, based on some sort of spectral method. And the second stage, I'm going to run gradient descent. Okay, now the question is that uh, how well does this, uh, this algorithm work? Uh, so this is, uh, this is uh, I'm going to, uh, in order to do this, let me try to repeat some of my assumption. Uh, so in general, this, uh, this problem is still MP hard, but we need to make some statistical model in assumptions in order to make this work. So these are the assumptions I have. Uh, first, I'm going to assume random sampling. So every entry is observed independently with probability p. p is not a p. It's could be a function of the dimension or whatever. You know, any any number between zero and one. But under but once p exceeds some value, and we will be able to say say some useful thing. Um. We assume random noise so that each of the entry is a zero mean, it's, it's an independent zero mean sub Gaussian noise whose variance is at most on the order of uh, sigma square. And we are also going to make more assumptions. First, is that it's a slow rank. So for simplicity, let me assume R is order one. It's not important, it can be generalized. We assume this to be well conditioned so that each of the rank one tensor component roughly have the same uh, magnitude. Uh, there's a third condition, which is very similar to the matrix completion case, is that uh, we are assuming it to satisfy some incoherence condition. So incoherence essentially means that each of the UI star uh, is delocalized in the sense of all of its. So for if you look at each of the UI star, its energy is more or less spread out across all of the entries. It's not going to be a single spike, something like that. It's going to be more, so all the, the, the energy across all of the entries are more or less the same. Okay, something like that. So with this, uh, I have a theorem, and then I'm going to explain my theorem to you step by step. Okay, so first thing, um, we have some Frobenius Euclidean norm performance guarantee. Second of all, uh, we have not only Frobenius norm guarantee, but also entry-wise guarantee. Okay. Okay. Now you have a lot of equations here. So let me try to explain the equation one by one in order to uh, tell you what, what this theorem is really trying to say. Oh, by the way, there's one thing that I forgot to say. It's that when I'm trying to estimate uh, the set of tensor uh, factors, uh, we have to uh, say th there exists uh, some permutation matrix that allows us to do this because, you know, permutating the tensor factors does not change the problem at all, and they are all the same. So you, 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 won't, you won't be able to tell which one is the first tensor factor, which one is the second. Because it's just, you know. But up to this ordering or permutation, uh, we are able to do some reasonable estimation. Okay, so now let me start with the first message here. The first message says that uh, we this algorithm achieves linear convergence. So if there's no noise, so if there's no noise means sigma is equal to zero, okay? Sigma is uh, noise level. If this is zero, and then we have linear convergence. So what is rho? Rho is some constant that is strictly smaller than one. So think about it as something like 0.8, okay? So it means linear convergence means that it takes a logarithmic time for you to sort of like converge. Second thing is that our algorithm, our theorem holds as long as the total sample size exceeds this order. And as you might have, you might still remember d to the 1.5 is the computation limit we have. So this is essentially the best that you can hope for if you focus on polynomial time algorithm. So as long as the sample size exceeds the computation limit, this theorem holds. 
Uh, next, we are able to get um, uh, near optimal statistical accuracy in terms of both the Euclidean error and also the entry-wise uh, error. Okay, so uh, just to, to answer, I think, uh, Will's uh, previous question was asking me uh, um, what, what would be the, the minimum lower limit looks like. Actually, it looks like this. It looks like sigma, which is the noise level, times square root of the dimension over P is a sampling rate. Uh, and times, you know, like the the, the scale of the, the 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 ground truth is something like that. So we are able to show someday some information theoretically lower bound that essentially take this form uh, up to some log factor perhaps. Okay. So in all of the prior work uh, that I mentioned, uh, they can show that their their statistical error is proportional to sigma, but in terms of the Dependency on D and P, they are highly suboptimal. Okay. Uh, so numerically, actually, this sort of like uh, it's performed as what we expect. So at the beginning, it's going to converge geometrically fast. Know that the the y axis uh, is plotted in the logarithmic scale. So if you see a a, 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 a a straight line here, it means that it's converging geometrically fast until it hits some error flaw. And this error flaw is sort of like the, what you have, uh, something at the level of the information theoretic limits. All right, okay, this is another thing that I like to emphasize is that uh, some of the prior work trying to, not for tensor case, but for other cases, and they try to simplify mathematical analysis by assuming that every iteration uh, I can, employ a completely new set of samples. Uh, and it is helpful because if you, if this is what you have, you have independent samples in each iteration that help you perform analysis uh, in a much easier way. But unfortunately, using more fresh samples in every iteration is quite wasteful in terms of uh, the information usage, right? It, it wastes a lot of data. You can't imagine that one data is only used once. Then that usually it's not the most optimal things that you can do. Uh, in, in contrast, our results are actually uh, able to reuse all of the samples across all of the iterations. Uh, it saves, it, it is better in terms of the practical usage of data, uh, but also it introduces a lot of complicated uh, mathematical issues for us to deal with. Uh, particularly across these iterations, there might be very complicated statistical dependency across iterations that significantly complicates the analysis. Now, the question is that how are we going to deal with the complicated statistical dependency across iterations? Um, so in the interest of time, I'm only going to very briefly mention the key proof idea. Um, so, which is something that I'm going to call your leave one out analysis. Uh, the idea is the following. Uh, since we want to decouple statistical dependency, every time what we're going to do is just to try to drop. So this is only for analysis purpose. Every time I'm going to drop a small number of randomness and then rerun the algorithm and see the stability between them. Okay, this is something that uh, we have been used often in many other uh, problems, and we have actually included some uh, short tutorial in our new monograph on spectral method. But the idea is the following. So suppose that this is, let's look at the left plot. This is like the date, like the an illustration of the data we have. Now, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to drop, for example, one slice of data. So let's look at all the red part here. Suppose that we draw every data in this slice, tensor slice. And then I pretend that this is some data I have and I, I rerun the algorithm. So this is why we call leave one out, out uh, analysis. It's like leave out one part, small part of the data and then do the analysis. Why do we do this? The reason we do this is that since you are dropping this part of the data, then this red part of the data becomes statistical independent from this leave one hour sequence because it has never been used. 
And this allows us to use some of the randomness to help us perform the statistical analysis. And fortunately, since we're only dropping a tiny fraction of the data, uh, maybe it is still quite close to the original uh, iterate UT. So they are not going to be very far away from each other. Actually, they are very, very close to each other. And, and then because of this, then we can probably use statistical independence to help us understand UTL and then propagate all the nice mess properties that I get back to the original sequence UT. Okay, and that sort of like this is a general way for us to understand entry-wise error control. Uh, okay. uh, how much time do I have? For this? Do I still have time? Or? Yeah, about you know five minutes or a okay. bit longer. I'll try to yeah. just briefly mention the other part and then finish roughly in five minutes. All right. Okay. So, uh, so after we run this algorithm, there's a second question that has intrigued a lot of statisticians. It's about how to perform uncertainty quantification, and the question is the following. So now I start with my data. Now I find a way to estimate all of the entries. But because of the in the presence of noise and random data, missing data, and your estimation is usually highly random. Okay, so there are some uncertainty there. Now the question is that how are you going to assess the uncertainty level of your estimate? Or put them in, the, in a more concrete way, it was, can I ask you, can you build a confidence interval uh, that contains one particular entry here? Right. Suppose I want to know. Uh, where, what this entry is, uh, it's usually very useful to communicate to the user how, how wide the confidence intervals is, uh, which will sort of like tell the decision maker how to, you know, how trust, uh, how much they can trust the estimate. Now, coming back to our uh, MLE, um, now it's, it becomes very difficult in general to try to say something about the confidence interval. Uh, the main thing is that usually to build confidence interval, you need to have some sense about some distributional guarantees for your estimate. But since this is a highly non converse problem, and usually most of the classical tools break down here, it's very difficult to pin down the distribution of this non converse solution. And also more uh, in another practical question is that oftentimes you probably do not know anything about the noise distribution, noise levels. You don't even know whether uh, they, they might not have the same variance across uh, locations. So there's something called heteroscedacity uh, in the statistical literature. How are we going to be able to adapt automatically to the unknown noise level, noise distribution, and, and this heteroscedastic kind of things? And all of these could be very practical uh, issues for us to handle. Now, the question you, you might actually ask, like since I already got some estimation error bounds, and why don't we just use what I already obtained in order to do a uh, confidence interval? And the reason is that in all of the prior uh, theory, that, the, the theory that I just presented to you, we did not talk anything about the pre-constant. We will only say, you know, otherwise this is optimal. But the pre-constant could be something like very large, let's say 1,000, something like that. And if, if what you really have is a pre-constant equal to one, but your theory tells you uh, a, a pre-constant of 1,000, this is not going to be a useful confidence interval for us, right? This has become overly conservative. So we really want to have more precise uh, way to quantify this. Uh, fortunately, we are able to we are able to uh, uh, pin down some distributional theory for this. Uh, it turns out that uh, for most of the entries, actually most of the entries, we are able to uh, show that the solution we get from this non converse approach, it turns out that it satisfies some Gaussian approximation. So my estimate compared to the ground truth. Actually, the error is sort of like a Gaussian district, Gaussian approximately Gaussian variable, where the variance actually matches the Cramorat lower bound. This is sort of like a fundamental lower bound uh, for this kind of problem. So it's sort of in this sense, this is like optimal. Um, so I'm going to just 
quickly mention that a final thing. So, okay, so one thing that I forgot to say. So since this is Gaussian, and then we are able to just use it to build confidence interval, and the variance can also be estimated in a data-driven way. So we don't have to do theoretical calculation. We can do it in a data-driven way. And eventually this allows you to compute a data-driven confidence interval for each entry of the tensor unknown tensor. And finally, this kind of fine grain distribution actually allows us to even improve our estimation guarantees. So if the Gaussian noise is Gaussian, we are now even be able to pin down the preconstant in this case. Uh, so it turns out that this uh, estimation error is six times this kind of uh, these parameters. So it's very sharp and it matches the Cramer-Law low bound in the precise map. Okay, so I think this uh, finishes my talk and uh, these results are summarized in the following three papers. Uh, thanks for your attention. Okay, thanks for the very nice talk. Um, so are, are there any questions from the Zoom audience? Um, I can also ask um, some questions I had throughout the talk. So I, I'm I'm not that close to this area, so maybe maybe the questions are, are no yeah. kind of kind of silly or something. But so so this this is all for sort of third order. To, um, uh -huh. yeah, yeah. Uh, so, if if you wanted to do like fourth order or higher tensors, is it is this possible or like, it is it is all possible. Uh, yeah. usually you can do roughly the same strategy, just uh, but just just more notation, and by usually everything's the same. But somehow, so so the, the one thing I was thinking about is that when you initialize, somehow you use that you're trying to reduce to like a matrix problem, yeah. right? So one and way is that, the fourth order, yeah. yeah. So one way is you so so you're just going to make him fatter and fatter. Like if you have fourth order tensor, you're going to make it even fatter than the third order case, and usually it still works. Okay. So other things are roughly the same. Yeah, in particular, the non conflict optimization part is essentially the same. It doesn't really matter what the order is. Yeah, but in this, uh, you, you are, you're absolutely correct. In the initialization case, uh, try to do more theoretical analysis, but roughly the idea is the same. So you still do matricization in a very fat way, and then it still works. Okay, and your and your theory goes through in this, in this yeah. case. Yeah. There is some case that you might, be, we need to be more cautious is that if you have fourth order tensor, so, okay, so in tensor completion, there are two different regimes. They are actually require very different algorithms. Uh, one regime is the case I consider here where the rank is smaller than D. D is dimension of any side of the tensor. Um, so this is called uh, under complete tensor. Uh, okay. There is a case, it's a very important case when the rank goes above D, which is still possible in tensor. It's not like the matrix case where the ranks cannot exceed the dimension of the matrix. In the tensor case, D can well go, the rank can well go above the, uh, the, the, the ambient dimension. And if that is the case, then doing this kind of matricization will not work because if you have this kind of fat matrix, the rank cannot be larger than D. Okay. Right? So, and so you have to matricize in a different way, uh, maybe make it as square as possible in order to, to, to preserve more information about the rank. But in the regime that I consider in today's talk, when R is smaller than D, and then this is not a big issue. Okay, so, thanks. So how do the bounds that you presented depend on the order of the tensor? Like, like there's kind of, a, I guess there are-, there are oh, the order of the tensor? Yeah, like uh, you want to do three versus four versus five, how, how do they grow? Yeah. Uh, in terms of the, so there are two things. So in terms of the uh, statistical accuracy is something like this, okay? Uh, you will, you will, the K will only change the uh, prefactor preconstant here. So it will probably be, I, I don't remember exactly, it's like uh, maybe K choose two or something like that. I, I don't remember some, some, some. Okay. I, I don't remember, but it's some constant, only the pre-constant depend on K, the, the order, but in not in a crazy way. Uh, 
But there's one more thing that is very tricky is that in terms of how many samples are needed. And that, 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 that's more dramatic there. So uh, let me come back here. So computation limit, as I say, in the, th the third order tensor, it requires D to the 1.5. In the general case order case, I think it's D to the K over two. So yeah. something like that. Uh, so, so you need to have more and more samples in order to, to, to start. Uh, but the statistical limit is all the same. It's all D in that case. Okay. So, but the computation limit just become worse and worse. So that's okay. Okay. so that that part is more dramatic. But once you exceed the computation limit, and then the statistical accuracy does not change that fast in terms. Of, so, at least this is not going to be in the exponent. So. I see. I see. Okay. So there, there's a question from the audience. So, yeah. can, can you see that, or do you want me to read? Oh, it? Oh yeah, I see that. So have, so the question is, have you tried projective power method in the tensor case? It works well in similar problem in the matrix case. Uh, so it's a, uh, it's a great question. Um, so I see some of the, so I didn't do that, but there was some other work by I think Dongxia and Mingyuan, I think. Uh, they have tried to look at the, some sort of power method. Uh, whether they do projecting, I'm not sure because I don't know what to project to. But uh, but some some variants of the power method they use it as uh, the first step to initialize it. Uh, that works. So maybe some sort of some version of tensor power method or something like that. So so it's 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 fine. Uh, but still, the the second stage is typically needed in order to get, for example, exact solution in the in the absence of noise. So yeah. So, uh, but if you uh, and on the other hand, if you look at more, uh, for example, like discrete value kind of problem, for example, like if you look at uh, clustering, uh, but in this, in, but in this, you know, tensor in, in tensor data, and probably projective power method can be used there directly, uh, similar to to what we use in the the matrix case. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Actually, I, I'm curious. So it, there, there seem to be. Like you, you, you mentioned uh, Montaneri's method, which yeah. achieve, which which uses d to the the three halves samples, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. a, 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 a only has an approximate solution, even in yeah. the noiseless case. Yeah. So how how inexact is it? Like, uh, is it, yeah. The inexactness. Let me see. So so I I I don't remember exactly the quality. Is probably let me see. So. Uh, I think it's probably like d over p square root of it. Uh, let's no, okay, square root of I forgot exactly. It's something like one over square root of d times p or something like that. Uh, I see. So it would work well in a very that. high dimensional setting. It it depends on yes, yeah. So. It, it, it will give you consistent estimate in the sense that as dimension grows, the relative error actually is approaching zero, but it's never going to be zero. So I see, I see. it's all the small order one, but it's not zero. And and is that a worst case estimate of the error? Or is no, like, it's, a, also... it's an issue of the spectral method because spectral method never tried to estimate it in an exact way. Because that even for the matrix case, spectral method is like so. Spectral method is like trying to do the so so. There's an explanation for this. So since I have missing data, right? So what spectral method is trying to do is to view all of the missing data as random noise. So it treats it as noise. It does not treat it as missing data. It treats it as noise. Uh, so it allows you to get something useful. But since you are not really treating as distinguish between missing data and random noise. So there's usually a gap there. But in the optimization-based thing, it will very explicitly try, try to view these missing data as you know something that you will never take into account in your optimization procedure, right? So if uh, like, like, like in this optimization problem, I'm only look at the loss function is only over uh, all of the data that I observe. It does right. not look at anything outside of it. But spectral method is sort of like, I'm going to look at every everything. Okay, <laughs> so, sure. and then that sort of like give you an error. So. Okay, makes sense. Yeah. Okay.
Okay, any other questions on people from Zoom? Okay. We're ending right on time. <laughs> yeah, that's good. <laughs> yeah. In Thanks. that case, yeah, thank you for the very nice talk. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, yeah, everyone. Thank Fantastic. Yeah. Okay. okay, have a good day, everyone. Yeah. You too. Bye.